Rushing Wind Biker Church at 10 Peach Tree Court in Holbrook, New York, the crossroads of freedom and faith. God bless you all. Jesus loves you all. Father, we, uh, we're so blessed to be able to come together. We're not hidden in the dark room somewhere in hiding. We thank you for air conditioning. <laughs> but let us not forget that there are churches all over the world that are meeting in dark places walled in with heat more oppressive than than we've had the last couple of days and, and they love to be there and they love worshiping coming together as a, as a family Lord let us never take a, take for granted the simple things that you've made easy for us Lord let not the easiness make us soft Lord but let us just be grateful Lord just continue to teach us Continue to grow us, continue to help us build our spiritual muscles. Lord, have your way in this place tonight. But you are our cornerstone. There is no other. Let that thought resonate tonight. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You see it? How are we doing? Awesome. 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 It's a great day to be alive. Yeah. It's been uh, an interesting weekend, to say the least. Now, first thing I want to do is I want to say uh, thank you for Fernando. Fernando felt all your prayers. I spoke to him about well, 45 minutes ago. And he already sounds like a new man. Uh, for those who don't know, we had triple bypass on Thursday. Um, his heart was strong, just had some problems with the plumbing. So the doctors went in and uh, he already sounds like a different man. You know, he's praising God and he can't, he can't wait to get back and uh, praise all of us and uh, wanted to send his love and he said he felt all of your prayer. Um, he's going to be a powerful man for God. No, he's out of a hard life, and I think this heart problem has been an issue for several years, and it's taken a lot of his energy away. And, and just listening to him today, he's he's totally different. And uh, you know, God's doing the work in all of us, isn't He? Yes. Yes. Now, the event yesterday was extraordinary, and uh, and uh, Jerry, what Jerry didn't quite share, which is the reality of, of what happened with the storm. Uh, am I on? No. I'm not on. Dave, turn me on. Check one. Check two. Okay. So, so actually what happened is we were monitoring the storm for like three days. And for three days it said that around 2 o'clock the storm was going to come in from 2 to 7. And even when we woke up Saturday morning, it wasn't much different. And then we started to hear that it was maybe a little bit later. And, and what happened was the storm started to approach and got somewhere around Western Suffolk. And, uh, and it was heading right at us. And we prayed, I sent a prayer request on Friday night, that, uh, that God would move the storm. And I referenced Elijah, because Elijah prayed that it wouldn't rain, and it didn't rain for three years. And then Elijah prayed, and then it rained. And do we have the same God that Elijah had? Yes. God hasn't changed. Amen. And, uh, and actually, Brett was the one that showed me the satellite picture. As it was coming towards us, the storm broke into two pieces and went right around us. Amen. Oh, God. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen? Amen. And don't let anybody here dare say we got lucky. And don't let anybody say, tell you we got lucky. Because we were monitoring it from Friday, and, and there's no way we got lucky. We know the hand of God parted the storm, Amen. just like He parted the river, uh, the Red Sea, and the river. 
Jordan River. Jordan. Yeah. So uh, uh, also, uh, as Jerry said, peer mentoring has been extraordinary. It's growing, it's growing, and people are growing, which is the most important thing. And the thing that's about peer mentoring that's important is everyone brings their story. And, and, and just like in Bible study, what people contribute, you know, when we have more people in an environment of, of, of peer mentoring, the more everyone brings their, their filling of the Holy Spirit and knowledge through their lives. And so everyone's enabled to learn more and grow more the more people out of there. And so it, it's vital because as I've been saying, we're in a war. And the war is not getting any easier, it's getting harder, isn't it? You know? Now one more thing about that event. We had that event two years ago in the same weather. It was oppressive. Now, we almost had people dropping. That's how oppressive it was. You know, and then the difference in how he responded was extraordinary. You know, I mean, I, I had like, I, I had 10 bottles of water. You know, and I want to thank everybody who was bringing me water while I was cooking. Uh, because I, I might not be standing here, I'd probably be sitting doing this message today. But um, anyone that helped out, it was so appreciated. And the, the community was touched. And there were people who, who just felt the love of God. And we got to share with some people that I believe are going are gonna to be coming because they, they said they didn't know we were here. And, uh, and just the conversations went in a very good direction. You know? So um, it's a great day. And um, what I want to talk about today, everybody that is, is born develops something in their life that is a driving force. You know, you reach a time in your life where something becomes the backbone of why you get up in the morning. And, and why you do what you do. And, and it's a motivation, it's something that when all else fails, you always have this goal and this dream that you can fall back on that will help you get up tomorrow morning, that will make you go through the hard things in life. You know, and uh, life gets chaotic and tries to take over, doesn't it? Yes. We all need that one thing that our life is based on, the thing that pushes us through those hard times when life is chaotic and life tends to be random and scattered and, and you lose direction. There's got to be something and everybody searches for that one thing and some people have a dream. They're a dream and a vision for their life and they keep it as like the carrot before the horse. And so they'll persevere and they'll do things and they'll, they'll grow and even when they have a setback they say, well, we still have the goal, we still have the vision. You know, some people, it's their family that keeps them motivated. You know, especially as a, as a father and maybe a mother, that, uh, you know, with chaos, the family is the, the motivating force. You know, because family is important. I mean, we know that as, as people of God, that family is important. Sometimes we have that friend. Does anybody have that friend? That when all life is abandoned you, you have that one friend. Yes. You know? And that, that's, not, that's not a horrible thing until you find out one day that friend is just as human as everyone else that, that wasn't your friend. Um, but it's always good to have, have a friend. And, and we also have these things called religions and faith and philosophies and spiritualities that people will rely on. Maybe it's even a, a building. Some people, when, when things are chaotic, they want to get to the church and be in the pew and, and be at the altar. And, and it's, it's just a place where they can get away from everything and it's always there. And it's always dependable until the church does something that you're not that thrilled about. And all of a sudden, the one thing that was your pillar is shaking. And you'd like to think you could trust it, but something happened, and now the trust isn't there. And different faiths have different uh, pillars. You know, Buddhism is a very intriguing philosophy because it's, uh, it's the search and the goal to reach total nothingness. And they believe in reincarnation 
And reincarnation sounds very romantic, like, you know, you die and you come back. But the thing is, it's a very, um, it's a very dark philosophy because the only reason you're coming back is you messed up in the previous life. Yeah. And you have to keep doing it over until you, you actually live a life that is worthy of stepping out of the human condition to nothing. You know, because their idea of peace and eternity is getting away from the problems and the stresses of humanity into nothing. No pain, but no joy. No hate, but no love. You know, you have uh, uh, Islam. Now, Islam is a very oppressive religion. You know, I don't know if you know how Islam started. Muhammad had a, a vision. And he spent 10 years in, uh, in Mecca trying to create a, a religion based on love. Similar in, in kind of a way to Christianity. And for 10 years he tried to build this faith in Allah and the visions on love and community. And in 10 years he had a, a religion that was less than 100 people. And he turned into an angry, evil man. And, and the pilgrimage that we know as Ramadan was when um, uh, Muhammad went from Mecca to Medina. And on that journey became a very evil and treacherous man. And created this, this faith, this pillar of Islam that convert or die. And so he created this faith that billions are, are caught in based on a fear of a God that if you don't do what needs to be done that you will be in hell. The sad part about their pillar, if you ask the best of the Muslims, the, the holy men, you ask them if they're going to go to heaven, the best answer they can come up with is only Allah knows. Because the best of them don't know. That's their pillar. But it's all out of fear of not going to heaven that they do all the things that they do. You know, and you have the spiritualities that are out there, whether it's Wiccan, whether it's Satanism, um, Hinduism is kind of a spiritual philosophy. And, uh, and there's, there's traditions and there's um, things they do have an altar to try to move God and they, they go before an altar and they, they go to nature and they depend on a, a creative thing rather than the creator. You know, people there, their allegiance is to the universe. You ever hear people say the universe is? Yeah. It's yes. all coming together for me. Yes. You know? And, 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 and that, that kind of sounds good until all of you. You ever been in a place where you feel like the whole, the whole universe is coming against you? No. You know? Anybody been there? Yeah. You know? Like everything in creation is just, a, I can't do anything right. And when I think I do something right, it just turns to garbage. Mm -hmm. yeah. I want you to know, just you know, for, for, for understanding the facts, is the universe does not care about you. The universe is not against you. The universe is not for you. The universe is just there. And anything in the universe that conspires for you is because of the creator of the universe is leveraging the universe for you. And that's the only way the universe actually has any interaction with us. You know? How many have had dreams in their life that have been the thing that have motivated you? You set a goal. It could be years down the road. It could be a job. It could be a profession. It could be a lot of things. You know, I spent, I spent most of my formative years with a dream of, of going to a college because I had a pretty interesting childhood. So I had to come up with something. And so I, I did everything I could. And when life really stunk and when things got worse, you know, I had this dream and it was there. And so I always revert to back to closing my eyes and, and, and the what ifs and looking for the day that I could be on the beaches of sunny California, going to the university that I planned my whole life on. And I got there and then everything fell apart because it wasn't what I anticipated. It was something else. 
And you ever have your lifelong dream fall apart? What do you do then? When you have the one thing that was the pillar of why you got up in the morning and it just vanished and crumbled, what do you do then? Well, you turn into just a mess, because that's what I did. You know? How do you rebound from that? When everything you planned your life on, the thing you stood on to get up and walk out the door fell apart, and crumbled, you know? What most people do and what I did is you numb yourself. Most people don't have that goal. They don't trust anything. And so they live in randomness. And I don't know if you notice, life will take you wherever it wants to take you if you don't have something that your life is based on. You know, whatever sounds good, you're going to go in that direction. Whatever feels good, you're going to go in that direction. And eventually everything is going to disappoint you. Because you try to focus on that thing and it just lets you down. What do you do? You know, um, a lot of people, their foundation is themselves. You ever heard anybody ever say, you know, it doesn't matter what, I can always depend on me. Ever been there? Ever see how that works? I, I minister in a community where the majority of the people, they are the pillar of their life. <laughs> and you watch, really weeping, what happens to lives and families and destinies. Because I don't know about you, but the least, the least um, dependable thing I can depend on happens to be me. <laughs> no? Learn that the hard way. You know, so what do you do? Because life needs a foundation. Life needs something that gets you up in the morning. Something that you can look down the road and say, okay, I can get through this because that's there. When everything falls apart, I can stand on this one thing and know that I can regroup and I can start over again. Because this is the one thing that is dependable. The one thing that will never fail me. How do you find that? You know? What's the cornerstone you have in your life? Many people make it money. Money is security. If I have enough money in the bank, life can come at me any way it wants to. But I have my security blanket, which is my bank account, my retirement plan, my 401k. You know, when I was in, the, in investments, um, there was a time when Grumman was going down. And there was a man working for Fidelity that managed the one fund that almost all of their retirement plan was in. And he had a nervous breakdown. And he mismanaged. And hundreds of people, their futures were, were gone in a matter of weeks. The only reason I know that is they had to get another job and they came and tried to get in, into sales. So they would come into a, I was a prevention. And, and in a matter of a year, we had 15 people that came in because their foundation was gone. What they put in the bank and what they, you know, Grumman. Those who have the Grumman, right? Oh, yeah. You know? They found themselves 65 years old, two years from retirement, and their entire 401k, 95% of it was gone because a financial investment man had an earth breakdown. And all of a sudden the fund, I believe it was the Magellan Fund that just totally went haywire. One of the best funds that they were at the time. But that was their foundation. You know, there's only one thing that over time, over history, over the thousands of years that man has been in existence, that has proven itself 
It'd be the one foundation that will never disappoint. The one cornerstone that can't be moved, that can't be shaken. And the people who have put their life fully on that cornerstone always have a victorious life. And that's Jesus Christ. Amen. He is the only cornerstone. He is the only thing that is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And though the storms of the world blow all over the place and shake everything else there is, Jesus Christ never changes. And faith in him perseveres and is victorious over absolutely everything. And this was the big revelation to the first church. We're traveling through Acts, and, and we talked about Pentecost, and we talked about the Holy Spirit came in. And, and, and Peter preached a message. He was filled with the Holy Spirit, and 2,000 people got saved. And then they went out, and they were going to pray. And there was a man that was lame. And, and, and you know, silver and gold have I none. But what I have I freely give you. And the man was healed. So get up and walk, and he was healed. And he's dancing with them into the temple. And then Peter starts preaching again. And when Peter preached, he pissed everyone off. When you preach the hard truth, and when you preach the name of Jesus Christ, people get pissed off. People get unhappy. And so what happened was they arrested him. He was preaching in the, well, it was outside of Solomon's porch, which is outside of the temple. A big crowd, because when he preached his second message, it said that 5,000 more people came to Christ. Now, that's only men. Understand that in a matter of a day, the church went from 120 people, if you include women and children, maybe 20,000 in a matter of one or two days. That's the power of God. And it's the power of the name of Jesus Christ, which we talked about in those last week or the, the week before. The power that is in the name and the gospel of Jesus Christ. So now Peter and John are arrested because the Sadducees were there. And I don't know if you know the difference between Pharisees and Sadducees. You see, they were both high religious leaders in the Jewish system. And the Pharisees believed in the afterlife. And the Sadducees didn't believe in the afterlife. There was nothing after this. When I read that and I hear that, why bother having religion if there's nothing after this? What's the point of it? And so the Sadducees were upset and they had Paul and uh, not Paul, Peter and John arrested and they were put in overnight and all of a sudden the higher um, religious leaders were like, what are we going to do with these guys? One day, Two men, 120 people that are in the background, basically cheering and praying. And 20,000 people, their lives have changed. And so what happens is they brought out into the middle of this inquisition, because that's what it was, an inquisition. In Acts chapter 4, verses 5 to 12, it says on the next day, that's the next day after they were arrested, the rulers and the elders and the scribes were gathered together in Jerusalem. And Annas, the high priest, was there, and Caiaphas. Anybody remember this from like Jesus Christ Superstar? Yes. These names? <laughs> no. And John and Alexander and all who were the high priestly descent. When they placed them in the center, they began to inquire, What power or in what name have you done this? Then Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. Understand as we go through Acts, this is going to be a reoccurring theme, being filled with the Holy Spirit. He said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we're on trial today for a benefit done to a sick man, as to how this man had been made well, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. By this name, this man stands here before you in good health. He is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, but which became the chief cornerstone. 
And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among name, men, by which we must be saved. See, they asked Peter the wrong question. They opened the door, and Peter ran through. By what power? Then Peter, who was filled with the Holy Spirit, was filled with all the power of the Holy Spirit. Watch out for the man who was filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. I mean, really filled. But there's no flesh, just him. And you see power like you've never seen. I think it was Moody that says the world still has not seen one man who's been totally uh, sold out for Jesus Christ and totally filled with the Holy Spirit. The world has not seen what one man like that could do. And we've seen some pretty powerful people of faith. Peter is saying to them in, in no uncertain terms what we've all been waiting for for generations. The answer to what God is all about. The answer to what life is all about. What will save us from the oppression of this life, the torturous of this life? What will save us from slavery, from condemnation, from bondage? He came. He's here. And you missed it. As a matter of fact, you were used by God to bring his prophecy into reality. The cornerstone of existence that God told the prophet Isaiah will be put in place. Now he's preaching them their own word. In Isaiah 28, 16, it says, Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I'm laying in Zion a stone, a tested stone, a costly cornerstone for the foundation, firmly placed, and he who believes in it will not be disturbed. And he said, King David, your great king said 900 years ago what has just happened. And in Psalm 118 it says, Open to me the gates of righteousness. I shall enter through them. I shall give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. You know the story about behind the gate? Well, this is where that all started, that thought. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous will enter through it, and I shall give thanks to you. For you have answered me, and you have become my salvation. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. And this is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. Amen. 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 You know, we can search our whole lives for something to base our life on. You know, some kind of foundational thing that will keep us through everything that happens in life. Something that we can understand the reality even of our existence. You know? And also uh, an understanding of what happens after this existence. There are all kinds of strange things out there, diverse things out there. We only need one thing. There's only one cornerstone that will solidify us in this life and solidify us in the life to come. Because there is only one solid cornerstone. There's only one foundation in your life that will never change through this life into your next life. And that's Jesus Christ. Isaiah stated it 700 years before Jesus was born. David stated it 900 years before Jesus was born. Jesus himself stated it when Peter answered his question, who do people think I am? And Jesus said, you are the Christ, the risen, not the risen, the Son of God, the Messiah. And what did Jesus say? So Peter, you're right, and on that rock, I will build my church. He was talking about himself as being the Son of God. He was saying, I am the foundation that is going to build the kingdom of God on earth. Jesus himself said it. And now Peter says it in no uncertain terms. Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the stone you rejected, has become the chief cornerstone of life. 
scary. I wish we could all be like Peter, don't you? You know how much the world would change if we were all like Peter? You know? You need to understand here that the most profound name in creation is Jesus. The only thing that can save you from the effects of this life and give you a solid eternity in the next life is Jesus. There is nothing else. There will be nothing else. We hold the exclusivity of the answer of all humanity. But we need to know that it's our cornerstone and we need to make it the cornerstone of our life. That everything we do and everything we say and every decision we make is based on that solid rock. Not what we want, not on our flesh, not what we think, not what the world wants to coerce us into believing. That's true. Because nothing can save us from the effects of this life. See, when Jesus, when, when Peter healed that person, and it led into this conversation, right, he healed a man that was lame from birth. And he was a victim of a corrupted humanity. Because he was lame from birth because so many years earlier, Adam and Eve sinned, brought corruption into our existence and changed how we interacted with the environment, how we interacted with each, reacted with each other. And through that, there was genetic predispositions that came through the corruption of what we ate and what we did and who we married. And all over that time, it created birth defects. And it created things like cancer and all kinds of sicknesses. You know, sometimes we think sin just affects the spiritual and emotional part of our lives, but sin affected the very environment. The only reason that we have the weather, the weird weather we have, is because man sinned. And when we started react, inter interact, interacting with creation in a way that was unhealthy for creation, whether it was killing and now blood was spilling into the ground that changed the composition of the very nature of the ground that we were supposed to be in, the things we've done to corrupt our air. Global warming is a reality. We can do nothing about it. Only God can take care of what's going on. The tornadoes, the earthquakes, the hurricanes are all a byproduct of how we corrupted our very atmosphere and our very nature. Much of that came in when, um, when the flood came in because it totally, totally warped the, uh, the makeup of our environment because the firmament that was above had to come down because God had to use it to wipe out humanity. So everything we had that protected us from the sun came down in, in, the, in the flood, 40 days, and left us needing sunblock when we were out on the barbecue for four or five hours. You know? And only God can save us, and only Jesus can save us from the effects of this corrupt world. And also usher us into eternity. But well, when he said, there is only one name under heaven by which you might be saved, you sometimes just think about the eternal ramifications. That man was corrupted by the human dilemma. And there's only one name under heaven by which he could be saved from what the human dilemma did to that man. And so by the name of Jesus Christ, he was saved from the effects of a cruel humanity. And that's what part of our salvation is. You know, when you say, I've been physically healed by faith in Jesus, it's because Jesus saves. When, when you, you, you've been empowered to overcome the demons and the emotional things in this life, and say, God healed me, and God delivered me from depression, and all these things because Jesus saved. And he saved you from the effects of a cruel humanity and a cruel world. When we've had some of our tangible needs filled, seemingly randomly, right? Because that's what the world will tell you. It's because Jesus has things in place with the church and even with people outside of the church that he's ready to save you from the financial effects of this world from the needs that doesn't seem like they're going to be filled. 
Jesus came to save us from not having our needs taken care of. And sometimes that is filled by miraculous things. And understand when someone in the church reaches out to you because you have a need and brings your food, puts tires on your car, maybe helps you with something, maybe helps you get an apartment, that's because the Holy Spirit is in there and because Jesus has empowered and brought everybody together so we can take care of each other. And it's not us that's helping you. It's Jesus Christ in us, the hope of glory in your financial situation, in your living situation. Because that cornerstone never fails. It never fails. But just like Peter was grilled when you uh, proclaimed, I was healed, or God provided, or we're going to go out in the next couple of weeks and we're going to show people satellite pictures of a storm that broke up by accident right before it got to our event. And people are going to grill you and they're not going to believe you. And what are you going to do? I pray we can react like Peter. In verses 8 to 11, he said, Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, rulers and elders of the people, if we're on trial today for a benefit done to a sick man, when you go out and you do things in the name of Jesus, it might be healing someone. It might be helping someone. You tell someone that you know money came in the mail out of nowhere. They're going to look at you and they're going to, really? You know? And people are going to grill you. And it's going to be a really weird situation because if you think about it, a man was crippled from life. And they're busting their chops. They don't care about the man. And they don't care that you might have had a need filled. And they don't care that you might have been used by God to pray for someone and they got healed. All they care is you dropped the J-bomb and ain't dealing with the J-bomb. Because the world doesn't want to hear that name. Because with that name comes responsibility. And they want to hear about the cornerstone because they don't want that cornerstone. They want the life that they want. And they don't even understand that their life is a disaster. Because the vast majority of people in this world live a life that's a disaster. They don't even know it because everybody else's life is a disaster. You know, they're spending time in bars and they're, they're drinking to have a good time because they had a hard day at work and now they gotta unwind. And now they gotta you know they gotta do whatever they gotta do. And that's normal life. They don't even look at themselves. Why do you have to do that? Because life stinks. I don't know about you, but I love Jesus. My life don't stink. You know? And I don't care if I'm laying in the hospital. I don't care if I'm worried about a bill coming in. Life is great. It's a great day to be alive. You know? There are no bad days when Jesus is the cornerstone of your life. If you're having bad days and you're really letting it get you down, I'll tell you right now, it's because Jesus is not the cornerstone of your life. Whatever you're worried about, Something about that has become one of the cornerstones of your life. It might be money, it might be security, it might be relationships, it could be anything. There's only one cornerstone that will stand the test of time and will never fail. You. So you need to make Jesus the cornerstone of everything in your life. The thing you rely on to take care of your needs, your loneliness, your depression. He needs to be the one that you stand on and say, I know, I know that I know it's going to be okay. Because I'm standing on solid ground. You know that song, right? Yeah. All other ground is sinking sand. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. You know? There's a reason these old hymns kind of make sense. You know, and as I as I kind of wind down the question, some of you still might have, and everyone else in the world has. Why should I trust in Jesus as the cornerstone of my life? How can I depend on Jesus to be the one thing that I can stand on for everything in my life? How do I know that? Because He's long gone. 
And now we have a, a book. And we have a lot of happy people that are telling me stuff. You know? What are your options? That's where I want to start. You're going to, you're going to depend on yourself? I think we all know where that goes, right? A dream, for the most part, stays a dream. It's like uh, Don Quixote chasing windmills, thinking they're dragons. And you run your whole life chasing something. You never get there. And like what I experienced, you get there and it's nothing what you expected. Because it's all smoke and mirrors. There's nothing that can really be something that is solid enough to make your life worthwhile. Financial security. Um, what I mentioned is one of the worst stories really that has happened um, in modern times with one particular company. And, and to see men in their 60s, late 50s, 30 years under their belt working for Drummond, they're not going to you know? And it wasn't even the company, it was the company that decided we're going to put our 401k with this particular group. Trusted somebody to put it in one fund. It's a scary proposition. You know? Um, we can put our, 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 our trust in the government. Well, no, we can't. <laughs> but there are people out there that do. You know? And then you become a slave to the government. Yeah. Your family, your friends, or even religion or spirituality. See, Christianity is not a religion. We get grouped in with everything else. And sometimes we fall into this mindset that we are just like everyone else. We're another religion. We have a God that we worship. We do stuff. We sing songs. We pay tithes. Religion is the worst thing that happened to Christianity. Because it was never a religion. It was a relationship. And we say that, but do we know that? You know? When we come in here and we sing praise music, it's not because it's Sunday. We gotta come and we gotta sing praise music. It's an opportunity for each one of us to come in a place, close our eyes, and be intimate with our Savior and worship and praise and talk to Him and sing to Him. We talked about it in Bible study Friday that do you know God sings over you? God sings with joy over you individually and corporately. And we should just close our eyes and just appreciate it. And it's not a religious experience. It's like when we go home and we see our kids, or when we see our father, or when we see our brothers, and we just love being with them. And that's what this was always meant to be. This is not a philosophy. Jesus said a lot of good things, didn't he? But you know, our religion is not based on those good things. You know? Jesus said a lot of things that were good, and then he said a lot of things that we don't like. Right? Uh, love your enemies. They didn't like it then. We don't like it now. Right? Marriage. One man, one woman, rest of your life. They didn't like it then. And they don't like it now. Right? Serve each other. Give to others and don't hold back for yourself. They didn't like it then. And they don't like it now. Why would anyone join this religion? If someone threatens to kill you for your faith, let them. Because God is glorified in that testimony of someone who won't change for anything. See, there's a difference with people that die in Christianity and people that die in Islam. People that die in Islam killing people to get killed. They're on suicide missions. Right? We're standing in a place where I'm not going to lift my hand to anyone else. 
And if I have to deny my faith, I'm not going to deny my faith. There's nothing you can do to take my faith away. If you're going to kill me, it's my day to go. There's nothing to take you out of this life before God ordains that day. If you're standing on a solid rock, there's nothing that can take you. There's nothing that can hurt you if you're standing in that place on the one thing that is secure. What gave Peter this conviction? What is the power in the name? What is the saving power in the name? When we jumped into this faith, we accepted a lot of good things. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I'll be peace, peace like you've never seen it. I will comfort you. Joy, unspeakable. Love your enemies. So he smacks you, turn the other cheek. It's a mixed bag here. Who would jump on that bandwagon if it was a philosophy? Who would do that? You know, Peter and Paul, they had the advantage of being with Jesus. They saw him nailed to the cross. That first church, many of them saw. You know, Jesus came back from the dead and preached to many people. Probably several thousand. You know, they say there were at least 500 at one time. And he was there for 40 days preaching. Dead man preaching. It's an advantage to being there. But I think we have a bigger advantage 2,000 years later. And I'll tell you why, and I don't think you've ever thought about your faith this way before. Muhammad is dead. They know he's dead, there's a corpse, there's bones. The philosophy is based on basically a book of things to do. But he's dead. And he's gone. And so they have oppressive religion. And so they run in fear, and that's what they work on. Buddha is dead. Don't know if he ever got to nothingness. I tend to think he probably would have liked nothingness right now. But he's dead. And all that's left is a bunch of philosophy. Nice philosophy. And to be honest with you, a lot of it coincides with what's in the Bible. So you wonder where they got their stuff from. The people who started all these spiritualities, they're dead and they're buried. Just think about the credibility of our, our faith that we believe in. If Jesus didn't rise again, and if he didn't walk out of the grave, where are all lunatics? 2,000 years later, this man is affecting the world. And people are coming forward knowing that i got to turn the other cheek. I may die for my faith. There's only two things that I can explain that Christianity didn't die in the first century. There's only two explanations. The first one, this has been 2,000 years of mass hypnosis that keeps growing. Have you heard that theory? <laughs> that you've all been like, this mass hypnosis for 2,000 years. Because there's no reason why you want to follow Jesus. Just think of all the things you're doing. Think of what you got to do. Now, who would sign on to that unless there's some, like, eerie mind control thing going on? The only other explanation, Jesus walked out of the grave. The only reason... Christianity exists because Jesus had to walk out of the grave. The only credible reason we are here and that Christianity exists in the world today is he walked out of the grave and that was a reality. There's nothing else that makes sense because nobody would sign on to this. No one. Think about that. Think about what would happen to, that, that, you know, what would it take for you to be convinced that your brother is God? <laughs> you look at the first church Mary was part of the first church worshipping her son as God 
His brothers and sisters worshiping their brother as God. James, who wrote, James, brother of Jesus. Jude, who wrote, Jude, brother of Jesus, believed his brother was God. Now, all these things are factual. See, you, know, you can pick up this book, and, and people, they look at you like, ah, it's a book of fairy tales. One day I'm going to give you statistics on the, uh, the credibility of the historic value of this book. There is no more accurate historical book by historians than the Bible of what happened in the world through that time. It is documented history. And a very small percentage of this is actually faith stuff. Yeah? But then you start to see that there is stuff that gives the faith stuff credibility when they start finding things they can't explain. But the biggest credibility that we have that Jesus was the Son of God and walked out of that grave is we are still here. There is nothing that that you know you can't convince people for two thousand years. Just let people kill you. Whatever God puts in your hand and gives you prosperity is there for you to give away to those who don't have. Not a popular philosophy. We're all selfish people, aren't we? There is a Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit only can one way. And that was a dead man walking out of the grave. Everything hinges on that. Understand the reality of Jesus as the cornerstone. Nothing else, scientifically, theologically, historically, or archaeologically, makes sense that we're still here. It doesn't make sense if Jesus doesn't walk out of the grave and walk for 40 days and send his Holy Spirit. We will not be here. And that changes everything. You guys want to come up? Are we fine? So what, what can we trust as a cornerstone? What is the only thing that's proven itself for over 2,000 years? So you can trust Jesus because the, the truth of the matter is we're here because of the reality and the historical truth that Jesus walked out of the grave and was the Son of God. There's nothing that logically makes sense. Unless you want to buy the 2,000 year massive gnosis theory. I know some people that believe that. We have a good friend that was in our bike community that believes that. Right? Yeah. Anyway. Christ alone, our cornerstone. Weak made strong by the Savior's love. Amen? Amen. Jesus Christ of Nazareth, there is no other name under heaven by which we may be saved from the effects of this life and for our eternity. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we, we thank you for your Son. <coughs> well, we thank you that we don't have a religion, that we just have to believe a lot of stuff and we have to do a lot of stuff. But Lord, we have a historical event that happened. That one man walked this earth, suffered and died, and walked out of the grave three days later. And there is no logical way to discount that with what happened after. Let us understand that. Let us make Jesus our cornerstone for every aspect of our life. Because those are the only aspects of our life that are going to be solid that we can make the right decisions, that we never have to worry about things just going the wrong way. Let us make him Lord of everything. Our finances, our relationships, our loneliness, our mental stability, our social life. Let us watch you fill us with your spirit. 
like Peter did. Peter didn't have 2,000 years of proof positive that the Holy Spirit is alive and well. He had a mere couple of days at this point. So where we didn't walk with Jesus, we have 2,000 years of history of Jesus changing the world. Let us stand on that and change how we look at everything in our life. Let's all pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Save you from this cruel world. That's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 